thank you. Uh, I should uh, correct that introduction. I was with the University of Mumbai and I retired in 2016. Uh, since then I have been an itinerant chairman at conferences at different places. But really I must uh, thank Adri and CEPPF for uh, the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be here uh, for the learning naturally and more importantly for the chance to uh, catch up with old friends. Well, I'm not going to keep you any further from uh, the speaker of this afternoon. Uh, we have uh, Jeffrey Hammer who is a solid academic and practicing development economist. A uh, PhD from the MIT, he was a uh, visiting professor at the Woodrow Wilson School, Princeton University. Between them, he was with the World Bank for 25 years, concluding his tenure of the last three years with the India office. He maintains very intimate links with uh, the country and is part of something very interesting called Economists Without Borders. Now, the subject of his uh, lecture this afternoon is a topic dear to all our hearts, which is health in India. And from what I can make out from the title, uh, he's going to bring to it a sophistication and rigor that we would expect of him. Jeffrey Hammer. Uh, thank you, Professor Correa. I hope I live up to that. <laughs> and thank you to, for the, thank you, thank the org organizers for uh, inviting me to here. I'm um, uh, uh, always happy to come to Patna. Not everyone is, but. Um, anyway, I also uh, have to apologize for the uh, title. Originally, I, it was the more general health policy in India, ideal and actual. I wanted to switch the switch gears, though, um, because the, the original one seemed to be to fall in line with a lot of Indian thought of designing whole systems, like uh, having an ideal system uh, uh, under under our control. Um, and I really wanted to focus more on incremental improvements in welfare that we can expect from the, um, from the, from the health sector. And so I actually wanted to dis discuss more in terms of picking specific things um, rather than designing whole systems. So I got this quote from some guy, um, some obscure English uh, economist, I think, um, uh, writing in 1926. And uh, Keynes says, the important thing for government is not to do things which individuals are doing already and to do them a little bit better or a little bit worse, but to do those things which at present are not done at all. Obviously, he was talking about real public goods. Um, uh, it's interesting that in 1926, England was really laissez-faire. They had only introduced compulsory secondary education 10 years before this. And he and Keynes always had to push for, to get anything approved as a matter of government policy. From India, where it's always seemed that anything good is worth having free from the government, um, <laughs> Uh, we're, fight, we're coming from the other direction that uh, uh, instead of government taking care of everything, I would like to come back and meet in the middle a little bit and decide which things really have to be done and which things might go by the wayside. I only have two things to say about policy, whether it's health or agriculture or electric power plants or anything. Uh, this is any policy ever. First of all, provide public goods before private goods. Uh, that's a little bit extreme. What I really mean <laughs> is uh, fix really bad market failures first, and bad meaning those market failures that have a serious welfare effect on the public. I have never been to a conference where anybody said, you know, I've looked at all of the data and I don't think there's a market failure. Never been to, to any such a, um, a conference. There's all, I don't know if there's any such thing as a perfect market, um, and, but it's very important when there's scarcity of resources and of um, skilled government uh, abilities uh, to fix everything at all um, but rather, we sh really should order these in terms of which are the big problems in, in terms of welfare, not just any problem. You can always have some information asymmetry that does something or other. 
Uh, and this morning, uh, Govinda mentioned merit goods, which is sort of like things that no one really wants <laughs> um, that can, be, can justify. The other one, and this is uh, a problem of the profession, or had been until, I guess, recently, which is a lot of uh, firepower is, is generated in trying to d determine the, the uh, uh, market failure or the size of the market failure. And then we do one of two things. We um, say government, if you identify a market failure, government can just seamlessly and fluidly come in and fix it. So we get a little bit of a market failure, we just come in and fix it. I think that uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And there are some things that are um, easier to do than others. So I would say do things you can do before trying those you can't, or take constraints on government capabilities seriously. Um, good enough. In health, when we apply this to health, it's a simple argument. Some health policies address massive market failures and some don't. Uh, first of all, there's the real public health goods, uh, which most of the developed world had introduced by the end of the 19th century. Um, sanitation, uh, draining of swamps, addressing real public goods and go goods with big externalities. Almost everything related to communicable disease is more likely to, in, to uh, involve an, a real externality. What, the, what is an externality? It's non-market mediation of, uh, of effects of one person on the other. What is a communicable disease? It's you don't usually have a market exchange for catching tuberculosis. Um, so, so we have the real public goods which are generally um, uh, directed at uh, infectious disease. The second real big characteristic of the, of the health market is everywhere, always, health insurance markets fail. We see, that, and that's why in Europe, you see that the government has replaced the insurance market everywhere. Sometimes they replace the medical market in a few uh, cases, but the, the larger countries have just taken over the insurance um, um, part of the, of the sector uh, and uh, uh, introduced health insurance. I'm not sure whether health insurance is the um, uh, right or only thing to do, uh, but it's always the case that people are in extreme uh, risk of falling into uh, dire straits. In India, we, I think there are still pockets of um, bonded labor, so uh, when you are hit with a really high medical bill, we have all the surveys uh, that, that are uh, directed at what do poor people worry about, and they always mention uh, being hit with a, a, um, a random shock of uh, a hospital bill. Nobody's really concerned about a random shock of two or three hundred rupees. They're worried about random shocks of thousands or lakhs of of, of rupees. Um, primary health care, which has been the bedrock of a lot of the uh, concern both in India and uh, the rest of the world, it's not completely obvious what that market failure is. And we'll get back to that. Second part is some health policies are particularly important for the poor. That one's, um, I, I just mentioned, and some aren't. People keep talking about the dual burden of disease, that is, there's still um, infectious disease to worry about while non-communicable diseases are, are building up. I'm not sure what, what that has to do with uh, government's priorities. Uh, communicable disease might still be the, uh, uh, the right target, uh, since we want to, uh, government expenditure to improve the in distribution of income. Some health policies are hard to implement, some are even harder. So, one um, good real public health good that we might have is in our cities to have a functioning sewer system. Seems like a minimal kind of thing to expect from a developing country. Um, and you might say, well, that's actually kind of hard to do. Technically, it's not so hard. Obviously, lots of cities in the world, almost every city in the world has a sewer system. Uh, but uh, getting land rights or moving people, such like, that's kind of hard. But some of the things in the health sector are even harder than that, like trying to get a doctor to uh, move his family to remote rural areas. The doctor obviously has a college degree, would probably like the same for his or her um, 
uh, child, and it's really hard to manage doctors who think they're better um, uh, and, and smarter than anybody who's monitoring them anyway, and that becomes very hard to do. So I, the main point that I want to say is policy should be strategic to try to get the most welfare improvement possible in an incremental fashion if you can't redesign the whole system. Uh, and that's relative to what happens uh, without a policy, the counterfactual that's come up uh, several times, given the money and the implementation constraints that uh, adhere to different kinds of policy. All right, maybe it wasn't so very simple, uh, but in any case, this is the, uh, uh, the position uh, that I would like to, uh, to, to look into in the health uh, sector uh, as we go along. However, this is basically all I really had to say. So, Professor Correa, any time you want me to stop talking, just tell me, and I'll, I'll stop in mid-sentence. Mid okay. In any case, shouldn't we get a handle on this before we spend a lot more money on, say, universally publicly provided primary care? And shouldn't we know a lot more about the many varied determinants of health before we spend large sums on anything? Um, in India, apparently not. So, we have policy statements starting from the Boer Commission Report of 1946, which said, there should be an uh, integration of curative and preventive medicine at all levels with seamless referrals, specific staffing per capita, and requirements and instructions for each level um, of, of care. Does that sound at all familiar? It should because there have been numerous reports since 1946 that basically say the same thing. The first one, the Medaglia um, Committee in 1962 noted that PHCs were not working very well, but advised spending more money on them anyway. This is actually fairly timely because uh, this is, what is this, 2018? I, I knew that. Um, this is the 40th anniversary of the Alma-Ata Declaration, which said the whole world should go for an integration of curative and preventive medicine at all levels with seamless referrals, blah, 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 blah. And uh, the, at uh, a meeting about the 40th anniversary of Alma-Ata, they said, yeah, you know, these PhDs, they're not working really well, but we should double down and, uh, and spend more money on them anyway. Uh, so uh, the world is actually following India in, in uh, most of this. Lots and lots of other reports. We come to 2005. I happened to have been living in Delhi at the time, and when the NRH, uh, the National Rural Health Mission, um, uh, came, came out, and they said they were going to have a whole bunch of new workers, and they were going to um, um, uh, support, again, uh, primary health care centers in rural areas. Uh, they did mention um, water and sanitation, but what we do know is that they hired ASHAs. Uh, at the time, I, said, I was thinking, you know, now would be a really good time to put in a baseline, uh, to, to have a really good survey that actually looks at people's real health problems. The, res the response I got was, well, the NFHS was coming, was, was about to uh, be done. That would serve as our baseline. But you know, the DHS, the NFHS, National Family Health Survey, has three or four questions about health. The rest of it's about family planning uh, and uh, didn't seem to really address most of the big problems uh, at all. Um, fast forward a little bit to uh, 2011, we have the high level expert group, which has, which I wanna, uh, which has a bunch of things pretty much the same, but from an economist's point of view, I wanna uh, point out, they said to reorient healthcare provision to focus significantly on primary health care while guaranteeing secondary and tertiary care. Well, I think economists uh, are good at making decisions about when to do one thing or another, when to make trade-offs, which one's better than what, which. What they were saying is no trade-offs, do everything. Um, the last line is a little bit mean, but it's possibly apocryphal, though it does is true. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So since it figures so prominently in India's health policy, let's start with primary care of health care. How's it doing? Okay, so we tried to push it a little bit harder in 2005 with the National Rural Health Mission. 
And I happened to be around uh, in the summer of 2013 visiting a friend at the Delhi School of Economics. And she comes in while um, uh, there was a, a, a downtime. And she says, oh, Jeff, you should come to the uh, auditorium. There's going to be speeches that discuss how, the su how successful the National Rural Health Mission was. I said, hmm, that's interesting, having remembered that I knew there wasn't a baseline. So I was curious as to what it is they were going to say was such a big uh, success. Um, and uh, there were three major speakers, one was the, the then Secretary of Health, uh, the uh, then person responsible for health in the erstwhile planning commission, and a third speaker I forgot, but they were all saying the same thing. We spent more money, this is the evidence of success. We hired more workers, this was evidence of success. As economists you kind of think, no, these are costs. <laughs> These aren't uh, really good outcome outputs or anything. This is really what you don't want to do because taxation is distortionary, so it costs more than a dollar to get a dollar. Um, and uh, workers usually, especially these kind of workers, have alternative uses. There is an opportunity cost. They also said we increased the capacity of states to implement policy, I guess. And that sort of uh, got my attention because I've been kind of interested in Panchayati Raj institutions for some time now. That's what I was assigned to do when I was at the World Bank. And I was, uh, so forget Panchayati Raj, in health we were just trying to get things down to state level. And so I was wondering, good, well I wonder what they mean by increasing the capacity of states. And what they meant was we got them to spend more money and we got them to hire more workers. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, there was not one word about a single child's life being saved that they could actually attribute to this policy. They could say what went in, what were the inputs, they had not a clue at what, to what the outputs were. Uh, so what is the purpose of health policy? To employ medical providers, to spend money, or is it to improve the health and well-being of the people of India? There is no one-to-one -one relationship between spending and getting something for it. Uh, the connection has to have empirical support. In fact, a report I don't usually like to cite, in fact, was the World Development Report of 1993, three, which uh, had a, um, a one graph that showed the deviation from mean from uh, uh, government spending on health and the, on the, uh, correlated with life expectancy. This is of countries. It was something that I used later when teaching statistics uh, to show uh, a, an example of perfect zero correlation uh, between one and the other. So if you are con contending that this is going to have a big effect, there should be a little bit of empirical support. The evidence isn't, very, isn't overwhelming. Um, so uh, this is state-wise NFHS for 1992 and 1998 for infant mortality and one to five mortality, doing propensity score matching, we don't have to worry about that. Um, and these are the, t the distribution of t-tests of those 100 or so um, uh, different uh, uh, tests. And we see that there's quite a lot of spread. There's uh, a few cases of significant effects in the right direction. We have a lot of not significant in the right direction. We have a lot that are not significant in the wrong direction. And we have a few that are significant in the wrong direction. Um, now, if you squint your eyes, you might see that this sort of looks like a distribution around zero. <laughs> and uh, since this is how many, this, since there were a hundred something uh, cases that we were looking at, you'd expect a few to come out significant, uh, whether wh whether there was an effect at or, or not. Uh, and we do, in fact, have at least it was, it's not perfectly symmetric, but. Uh, 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 it could be that the true effect is zero and we observe significant effects just because there's a distribution. And then you could ask me the question, so how come I didn't use 2005? Well, that's because they dropped the question about whether or not there was a primary health care center in your village in that particular round. I think it was making room for uh, HIV AIDS module or something like that. So it was not really possible to do it again and it's not possible to do it with the 2015 that came out. But how can this be? How can publicly provided medical facilities not help? Well, one is the public sector is pretty small relative to the market as a whole, so, and, uh, and it's of 
uh, the market as a whole is of widely varying quality. Um, and there does seem to be, anecdotally at least, and occasionally a good study, uh, to show that there's substantial substitution between the public and private sectors. The reason the, that the anecdotes are fairly convincing is practically anyone who's been in the field and discussed this with, with real people, you see that there's a lot of shopping around, usually a private sector, uh, low quality in, in rural areas, then they might try the public sector. If that doesn't work, they might go back to a different kind of private sector. So th there's a lot of um, um, uh, trading back and forth within an individual. So for the market as a whole, there's some sense that there is substantial substitution. As a non-traded good, you expand the uh, supply. You do have to figure out what the net effect on consumption is, where supply meets demand. Um, and if there is a lot of substitution, uh, there might be a very small net effect. And then you might ask a step just before that, <clears throat> which is what's coming out? What's the output of or the nature of the public sector anyway in comparison to the private? Um, this comes from Ajay's study of 2001 uh, on primary health care. Uh, it seems to not really, this is um, also a study that can't really be replicated because this relied on the NSS of 1995. I'm sorry I have to go far back in history to get any relevant data, uh, but happens to be true, sadly enough. Uh, you might ask why, if, if we think this is so very important, how come we only know bits and pieces of it every, once in a while? Um, but here this was a um, biquintile of all India. It seems to not matter at all how poor you are. Um, you still use the private sector about 80% of the time, um, regardless of your income level. Uh, hospitals, uh, this is on a different scale, and uh, it's hard to uh, put them on the same scale. The share of the private sector is much smaller for hospitals, but that was sort of back to my initial point of what's the major market failure in health? It's the failure of insurance markets. What, where does insurance markets, where do insurance markets really bite? It's where you actually have a, an expenditure high enough to need to insure. You don't insure against two or 300 rupees. The administrative cost would be higher than the payout for what you need to insure against is a catastrophic loss. So people all by themselves knew that and were using the public sector more for hospitals than they were for primary care. When I presented this uh, in many of these intervening years, people say, oh, just wait until the National Rural Health Mission comes along, you'll see that uh, everything's changed. Of course, I was still remembering that there was no baseline. Um, this is for 1995. The most recent NSS, it's every five, it's every 10 years on the year that ends in five. Um, uh, 20 years after 1995, I, don't, I can't do the same degree of uh, detail, but uh, it's the same 80% in the private sector for primary health care that we saw 20 years ago. Um, so, so you could say, so how come, remember the private sector, that's a really broad, weird sector. It goes from absolute quacks to consult and specialists in Ames or Safter Jung um, Hospital. So it's quite a v varied playing field. Um, but in any case, why do people use, not use free public care with real qualified doctors? You have to be an MBBS doctor to, to have a position in a primary health care center as a doctor. Um, uh, what, what's with that? And uh, I can tell you that it's not because they don't know any better. I bring students to, um, to India most years in the last 11 years, and uh, one of them was on a analysis of the health sector in uh, a, an important northern state. And we had a um, meeting with the director of medical services, and my students, after hearing the usual story about everybody goes to a sub-center and then gets referred to a primary center and gets referred to a CHC, et cetera, et cetera, um, my students said, you know, we've been looking at some of the data, and it looks like most of the people go to the private sector. How can, why is that? And I kid you not, the quote that made all of my students' head turn towards me was because they're ignorant peasants. Um, so the usual response is they don't know better. That is not really the case. Let me try to make an argument. Let's ask a different question. What happens when people go to PhDs? First of all, they might find that there's nobody there because of vacancies. This, uh, this is old data. I don't really want to push it very hard. And uh, I know that there are still major 
problems in getting uh, doctors in, in remote rural areas, and there's a big problem with specialists, but that's a, an, another, another issue. Although CHCs in remote, in relatively poor rural areas are having a really hard time getting specialists too, which they're supposed to have. Uh, so it's possible that there won't be someone there because of vacancies. There, it's also possible that there won't be some uh, people there because of absentee rates. So this is a study that was done in 2003. It's, we have to go back in history. Um, uh, done for the World Development Report of 2004, um, which uh, just had, it was a very simple study, and I'm ashamed to say that no one's uh, replicated it, uh, which was really just doing surprise visits at primary health care centers to seeing who was there and who was not. And at, uh, the, the national average, I've ordered, I'd ordered the states from poor to rich vaguely. I don't see much of a pattern. Some things are bizarre. Um, but in any case, the average for the country was about 42%. Um, and uh, while people say, oh, things are much better in, uh, now that the National Rural Health Mission, now the National Health Mission has come along, that's entirely different. But there hasn't been another study like this, and bits and pieces, a, colleague of, a former colleague of mine at the World Bank, uh, Biju Rao, uh, did one for uh, Karnataka, and he found exactly the same number in 2013 as we got in 2003, uh, eight years into um, a National Rural Health Mission. So people maybe got missing because they aren't assigned or haven't been filled. They might be missing because they're absent. The other thing that people might find is that some of these doctors aren't all that capable. So uh, Jishnu Das and I have a, 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 a few papers together, and he's continued and done a lot more after, um, uh, trying to come up with different measures of the quality of medical advice, the actual advice given by doctors and not just whether or not there was one there. And we, um, did, we usually do this in two steps. One, we uh, measure uh, by vignettes. These are hypothetical cases. Two people come in. One person be pretends they're a... Um, a patient and uh, says, a doctor, my chest is hurting, uh, what should I do? And then, they, and, we, and then we have this little back and forth between the pr practitioner and the interviewer. There's no deception here. They know they're being tested in a sense. Uh, and then we come up with uh, a, a score for, for that. Some of our friends, Paul Gertler in Indonesia and Ken Leonard in Tanzania, uh, use the same kind of thing, a uh, same kind of uh, uh, technique, and they found, but they were only looking at government hospitals. And what's kind of interesting is if the Indian distribution is obviously very bimodal. And the one on the right is pretty much um, in line with the other countries. A little bit better than Tanzania. We're a little bit richer than Tanzania. And a little bit worse than Indonesia. We're a little less wealthy than, than Indo Indonesia. And uh, the pump on the right is basically outpatient centers in Safter Jung Hospital or Hindu Rao Hospital in uh, Delhi. These are extremely well-respected places. Um, and private MBBS doctors. The, the lump on the, on the left are all of these quacks or the alternatively trained uh, practitioners who where quack is really not the right word. This would be bachelors of Ayurvedic medicine, bachelors of Unani medicine, bachelors of integrated medicine, anyway, BIMS, um, uh, and also quacks, including one that we ran into whose main job was uh, as a factory worker in a ball bearing factory seeing patients at night. Um, and, that's, and besides the, those parts of the private sector, it's also the doctors that we found in public primary health care centers in Delhi. What does low capability mean? Um, we, I don't want to go into the details of how we construct it. Basically, uh, we just score them on how well they answer the questions. And then we show, as a function of that latent variable, that, um, that, that score, what's the chance of not doing harm to your patient. And harm in this case would be, for the case of uh, viral pharyngitis, which is a cold, is you didn't give antibiotics. That would be the main thing. Also for a diarrhea, which is simple diarrhea in children not having antibiotics. And you can see that the average public primary healthcare doctor is a little bit less than average in our sample, and they fail to do no harm, an essential feature of their um, profession, uh, in four of the five cases. Uh, you can't see this. Besides the fact that they may not know 
exactly what to do, they also seem to not put in much effort. The blue, di the blue curve is, uh, as a function of time spent, how many important questions do doctors typically ask? Uh, and uh, you see that it's very steep. The first few minutes, the doctor can learn a lot. However, I don't know if you can see the, this curve. That's the distribution, that's the probability density function of how much time was spent. You might, you, if you can see that, you'll notice that the mode is at about one minute. The uh, mean is about three and a half minutes, and obviously the median for such a skewed distribution is something in between. But the, a lot of doctors seem to stop asking questions even though they're in a part of, this, of the blue function where an extra question would be a good thing to do. Thanks. What does very little effort mean? Well, basically, in, in the study that we did in Delhi, uh, low effort interactions are almost completely coincident with people in the public primary health care facilities. And that's less than two minutes, just one question. And the question is usually, kya hai? We were told by our um, uh, interviewers, which I don't speak Hindi, but I'm told that's not the nicest way to ask what's wrong with you. Um, and uh, almost no exam examinations at all. I don't know if you've s sat in some of these offices, but frequently a doctor will be writing a prescription as the patient is coming in. Uh, in rural MP, Madhya Pradesh, uh, Jishnu, this is Jishnu's data, um, uh, we are looking at um, the difference between those, those vignettes, those hypotheticals, and then using actors in this case and not um, uh, just a, a student watching what they do, uh, seeing whether, what they actually do in practice. You'll notice that public MBBS and private MBBS doctors are all virtually identical in how they do in the uh, hypotheticals, and a little bit better than the non-MBBS, which includes the quacks and the BAMs and BUMs and BIMs. Um, but when we actually send in patients, we see that there's an enormous drop uh, in both MBBS doctors, but particularly in the public, uh, from uh, just under six minutes to, again, uh, a minute and a half uh, spent with each of the patients. So, it's, some people say, oh, that's because there's this long line of people waiting to get service at the public clinic. That is absolutely not true. In this uh, case, public employees work, meaning seeing patients, 39 minutes per day, uh, what these diagrams show is the 5th and the 95th percentile of how many hours per day are you working. And if you notice, public less busy barely works at all. Very busy is a little bit more than a not very busy private provider. And of course, a busy provi private provider does a lot. So it's not because there's this long line of patients. It's just that's how they do business. Uh, and there's been several studies uh, worldwide and in India to see what the difference um, is between why doctors know some things but they don't actually do them. I'd like to go over this only very... Uh, how am I doing? Okay, then I, I really will just do this really quickly. Um, uh, one of the um, hypothetical cases is unstable, unstable angina. I, I'm told by my daughter-in-law who's a doctor is that we don't use that um, diagnosis anymore, but it's a minor heart attack. And the, um, uh, the, uh, the incorrect thing to do is not to give an aspirin and not to refer to get an EKG as quickly as possible. That's what you're supposed to do. When d shown the hypothetical, public MBBS doctors do great. Almost everybody, almost 90%, uh, do, do the right thing. And very, very few people get it completely wrong. Um, but in practice, you see that only 30%, that 70% of the, of the public doctors get this wrong. And what wrong usually means for this particular ailment is to give a, an, uh, an antacid. The, 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 the uh, actor comes in saying, I have this tightness in the chest, it hurts. <laughs> Take it. I mean, and then then is schooled on what he's supposed to reply to to uh, doctors' questions. And in 70% of the cases, they get it completely wrong in the public sector. But much better for private MBBS doctors. And just 
actually a tiny bit better among the uh, unconventionally trained doctors. So, what this leads to is poor diagnosis and treatment. One of the things that uh, I'm going to not talk about this too much, except for the last set of columns on the right, um, which is uh, what, there's a very serious uh, resistance to antibiotics problem in the country, usually because of profligate uh, use of antibiotics. And when you, when you talk to directors of medical services in the states, um, it's always blamed on the private sector, particularly the quacks. Well, if you compare the public sector, that's the dark line on the left, to the unqualified sector, which is the yellow, anyway, it's the column on the, on the right, uh, I really, I guess the, uh, the, the confidence interval isn't really that interesting because I think the difference between 0.32 and 0.32 is not significant. So, what do people find when they get to the PhDs? They got the vacancies, you got your absenteeism, you got people who aren't always that competent, you have low effort, and you have little difference between PhD doctors and differently trained providers, except perhaps lack of courtesy, which is more commonly shown in public sector since you don't really care whether the patient comes back to you, whereas the quacks would like them to come back to them. Uh, so uh, this is anecdotal. I followed my interviews around. It, it seems to be true. I would like to actually study that more formally sometime. But in any case, you might ask, yeah, I guess I see why you might not go to a free public uh, clinic uh, faced with all of this. Okay, five minutes you said? A few minutes. Okay. This is supposed to be an optimistic presentation. Um, and uh, it was also supposed to be uh, uh, directly related to uh, Ayushman Bharat. Uh, and I think we do have a few things to say about this. Uh, and so I'd like to go on to the other two prongs of, of health policy, public goods and hospitals, just for a bit. Some things are pretty sure to improve health and help the poor. Everything that affects uh, uh, communicable diseases, the traditional public goods, and some things that rich countries never had. So this is what rich countries did before medicine was at all useful. Sulfa drugs are invented in 1937, and penicillin comes out in 1949. It's unclear what doctors did before that. Um, and since then, we have a few more things in our armamentarium to how to deal with in poor countries. We have immunizations that work pretty well. There might be some debate as to how big is the market failure for immunizations, because it's based, the, the child is usually the main beneficiary of getting immunization. There is a chance of an externality to other people, but there's a lot of debate as to how big that is, and some say it's does not there at all. But from my point of view, I don't care. It's easy to do. The government knows how to send polio vaccinators into the field and get polio done. So whether it's a public good or a private good or has an externality or not, it's not that difficult. Go ahead and do it. Um, this is a study I uh, did in Delhi. Um, and all I can, I'm going to skip over this. What I would like to say is uh, water entering your home from the street, meaning it would be really good if there was a drainage system that uh, led to a uh, water treatment plant or in any way kept, kept uh, uh, garbage, uh, sewage away from people's homes, whether the, someone in the family uh, openly defecates or whether there's a neighbor trying to get at the externality who openly defecates. And we see that when everything is good, uh, infants, adults isn't adults, adults is people over five. Um, infants uh, get sick 13% of the time in a two week interval. Um, even when all of everything's working in their favor, they're in slums, so it's not too surprising. And if well, everything is bad, that jumps to 30% of kids were getting diarrhea in the last two weeks, which translates into seven. Uh, bouts of diarrhea per year, which if it isn't enough to kill you, is certainly enough to stunt you. These, this only works for waterborne diseases, never mind. Uh, we looked at the uh, san total sanitation campaign, the um, uh, predecessor to Swaj Bharat, um, in uh, three districts in Maharashtra. It turned out, in, in conjunction with my position that some things are hard to do and some things are not, uh, the, the two of the districts, they were supposed to have gotten the treatment. These were supposed to be treatment um, um, 
districts, but they're actually fairly remote places, and the government officials in the Rural Development Department simply didn't go there under direct orders to go there. That's in Nanded and Nanderbar. Amandagar, they actually did do it, and we got a, a very big effect on, in fact, too big, in, according to epidemiologists, um, effect on height for age in the place where the campaign actually was uh, implemented. So I would say, you know, not having a sewer system is a really bad thing. <laughs> and I don't have to be <laughs> too uh, uh, schooled in the uh, implementation details to know that a world-class capital city really should have a sewer system. So some of these things are like no-brainers. The second one is um, catastrophic care, which is fixing the catastrophic loss problem. Insurance markets always fail, that's what I said. It's a big problem for everybody. And there's a great feel of falling into debt. Problems at PHC level don't do that. So is public insurance the solution? Well, this is now timely. I, I thought this was going to be completely abstract, but uh, Ayush Bharat actually has a big uh, health insurance component replacing RSBY. Is public insurance the solution? Well, rich countries, except the United States, don't talk to me, um, seem to think so. But insurance systems, that is arm's length relation to providers, um, have lots of regulatory requirements and personnel that are hard to manage. So what are we really talking about? We're talking about second guessing a doctor's billing the government. Well, that means you need people to be watching all the time, looking out for cases of fraud. Uh, just think of this uh, as a possibility. Uh, a patient comes in with something that isn't particularly uh, dangerous, but the doctor says, you know, if you sign this sheet saying that you had this particular illness, I'll give you a lack. I don't know how many people would, uh, would turn that down, and it's very possible that he can bill the, the government up to five lakh. He wouldn't tell the, the, um, uh, the patient that, but think of whether or not that's a really bizarre, unthinkable kind of situation of doctors in the private sector in India. Um, in the US, there's the Medicare system for elderly people. And uh, that has tens of thousands of people uh, looking at after the uh, uh, case of insurance fraud, because the insurance is government in that case. And besides that, there's a, I don't know how many people in attorneys general's office, part of the criminal justice system, who are also looking very carefully at, at uh, uh, fraudulent insurance claims. This is a lot of people with a lot of experience and a lot of um, uh, education who are focused on ca catching uh, insurance fraud. Um, and I don't really think we're quite there yet in, um, uh, in India. This just says you can do too much, you can do too little. If it was just doing too much or too little, you could see whether there are people doing a lot or people doing very little, um, but it's not monotonic. So you actually have to know what the right thing is, which is why this is very difficult. Now, I would like to propose that, or I would like to hypothesize that public hospitals could very well be a substitute for insurance. Hospitals are kind of hard to run. In fact, I've been to, I forget its name, unfortunately, here in Putna, it was not uh, particularly attractive, but insurance is very hard to run. So this is one of those cases where we might be able to get public hospitals to operate to some extent, and, um, uh, we, w we might like to focus on that before we give a blank check to the entire medical community for buying anything that, uh, uh, they, that they would like to sell. So we need to know how well hospitals are working, given uh, the public pres presence in hospital care is much greater than primary care, and what does working well mean? Um, and another thing that I would love to be able to research, though the data, uh, the data there is no data whatsoever uh, that helps you, us with this, is, is it possible, and I would like to hear from the industrial organization people, is it possible that better public hospitals that provide a credible alternative to private sector hospitals where the exploitation of um, patients is extreme, um, uh, can a public hospital system that's operating well actually compete? 
and uh, attract patients away from this very difficult to, to monitor uh, private hospital sector. And will the effect be on prices, sort of moderating the effect of prices, making the demand elasticity a little bit higher, or on the quality? We have no idea. Uh, this is all speculation, but it's something that we really should look at. Um, the big problem, with, uh, another big problem with hospitals is it's really hard to get poor people there, and that's something um, that we uh, need to uh, try to fix. I know that in UP, a former student of mine is uh, taking Gates money and trying to help uh, improve access to hospitals via uh, ambulance. He seems to think he can do it. We'll see. Um, but in any case, a lot of these questions are, have not been asked and certainly not been answered, I think, because of this fixation on primary health care center. So in summary, um, I think it's important for us to, instead of trying to uh, design a beautiful system uh, on paper and say that uh, uh, that's what's going to happen, uh, we should actually pick our battles more carefully. Frequently people say, people say uh, the policy was designed properly, it w just wasn't implemented properly. And to that I would say, if you can predict that the policy will not be implemented properly, then it's a really crappy design anyway. Um, Population-based services I would like to push. Hospital care I would like to speculate about instead of insurance. And the case for universal publicly supported primary curative care is not obvious. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey Hammer, for that extremely clear exposition. I enjoyed seeing those graphs particularly. They were very evocative and educational. Um, we are particularly grateful for the last few slides because we were pulled out of our pessimism of the large part of the lecture and you, you know, brought optimism towards the end. I'm afraid we've run out of time, so maybe uh, comments and questions can be addressed to you at tea or over dinner, unless we have some relaxation. Uh, do we? But we really run out of time. One or two, uh, maybe that's one, uh, and that's two. Okay, that's it. One first. last few slides answered my standard question was, so what do you do about it to fix it, to move forward, which is great, but it still leaves the question, what do you do with what's already there? You've got this huge infrastructure in place, which is obviously not working. Do you have any suggestions of that? You've got a way forward uh, in general priorities and commitment, but there's this huge commitment already, and a lot of people, what do you do? Yeah, my, I'm Pranay, I'm from Takshashila Institution, Bangalore. Uh, my question was related to the primary health care centers. So, uh, in some states like Kerala and Karnataka, we saw that uh, fiscal decentralization meant that some decisions like procuring medicines or maintaining PHCs was being done at a local level compared to other states. So, did you see in your experiments that this kind of decentralization improved accountability in terms of controlling absenteeism that you mentioned? in your slides. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So for the, first one, for the first one, I think all economists when uh, confronted with policymakers have this issue of what do you do with fixed invest investment? And so we would call them sunk costs and we say, screw it. Um, uh, but uh, eventually I would say um, uh, the hospitals might become if we get them working and they see that they could better manage uh, diabetes if there was some more primary care, they might decide, given that they're only uh, um, reimbursed partially for diabetic treatment, uh, they might take the effort of going out into the community to save themselves uh, some money. Don't know? Uh, Kaiser in California has shown where they do have these um, fixed payments for, for particular diagnoses, did in fact hire nurses to go f follow people around to see whether they were taking their insulin properly, or even earlier than that, if they were doing the exercise and, and dietary regimen that was suggested to them. Possible, but I think but by the time that works, the, pr the current primary health care centers would probably have deteriorated. Um, I actually have no in information whatsoever on uh, decentralization. Uh, the ultimate decentralization is the, the consumer, the, the, the patient, and um, it's been a sort of a standard solution in the health 
sector to that money should follow the patients, and therefore you would think that they might be in a better position to tell whether they were properly cared for, whether they were cured or not, I don't know. Um, that's the ultimate decentralization. I'm biased in the interdirection of decentralization with zero evidence whatsoever. We have to close. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey Hammer, of course, and all of you for this session. Thank you. So I request uh, Dr. Sunita Lal to kindly hand over the mementos, firstly to Professor Correa. Thank you, Professor Hammer.